YouTube, it's Brian Phillips. Look at this, we've got the Marlin 64 millimeters EDF. It's about a thousand millimeters wide, or excuse me, about 900 and something wide, thousand long. This is made by Arrows. We've got included flaps, which is awesome. And then we set ours up to fly with the Arrows pack first. And that's a 32 or 3300 4S. And we got a little voltage alarm in here. And then basically we are gonna run that with an AR630 because this one doesn't come with the vector stabilizer. Mm -hmm. So we'll put it down right here and give it a shot. All right, folks, take off flaps are in. Oh my goodness, that gets in the air wow. quick. Minor roll adjustment there. Okay, out of the flaps. Man, that thing is rock solid right now, look at this. Little bit of trim down. See, I got that little bit of roll still. Could be a little bit of rudder. Doing some trimming here. Yeah, I see it's wanting to climb a little bit. Boy, that thing disappears in the blue yes, sky, doesn't it? Yes, it does. We're out of the flaps now. Pretty intense for four ass, goodness gracious. Easy flying plane, my goodness. Basically clicking a couple trims on the elevator still. Trying to get it dialed in. Feel like I still need more. Safe? That's cool. Rudder. Lots of rudder. I'm out of the throttle here. A little bit of throttle. Keep it over the tree line. We're in safe. That's full bank. Let's see how this thing glides down to the runway. In safe. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, out of safe. This thing flies really easy, folks. Surprised by how many clicks of trim I needed. It seemed like it was pretty straight out of the box on the alignment at the trailing edge of the control surfaces. Right over that short tree. That short tree is gonna blend to the next trees now. But boy, this thing is really zippy. Look at the roll rate, it's really good. Not quite as clean as the Futura. Of course, that's a lot more expensive plane but I was comparing it to the Futura. Okay, so let's put the flaps on. Okay, so that thing slows down. Oh my goodness, look at that. That is so good. Wow. Very easy to control still. A Little bit of throttle in the turn just to keep away from the stall. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can alpha this still. Oh man, with the flaps. Oh yeah, there's our little tip. There's our stall, watch our stall. Here's our stall. It's pretty violent, but the thing is, you can definitely correct it with a little bit of throttle and input. Upside down on the elevators, a little bit weak. You can definitely do it though. Take off flaps, landing flaps. Oh yeah, that thing, that thing warns you a lot before it stalls too. Okay, so let's just try this since it's so easy to stall. Ooh, a little grass landing action. Now we're not done flying. I just wanted to put it down. We have a five minute timer. I want to try to reset real quick, but those are fixed landing gear and they are quite robust given that this is frozen ground. They've got those nice springs on them. We know we can take off quick. So we're going to go ahead and do a take off flap. Oh yeah, look how quick you can get that thing up. And I brought it right to the stall point so I could clear all the power lines and everything, but I didn't need to. And by the way, I feel like the CG marks that they provide, the CG marks that they provide, ooh, is it beeping? Listen as we go by. Nope. Nope. Cornhole. Whoa, that's weird. <laughs> that was not a cornhole. No, it didn't complete. <laughs> okay, so let's just try flying it down this way, nice and slow, full landing flaps. 
Oh yeah. Wow. Boy, that thing is solid, folks. Really solid. It's, um, I gotta admit though, there is a certain amount of a asymmetric roll going on here and I can't figure out if I've got like maybe a little bit of trim left. Feels like maybe it's rolling just a little bit still to the right or to the left rather. You see how it's kinda, well, now of course I can't tell. So if you guys are new to flying and you're trying to learn how to trim, you wanna fly at level, maybe 50% throttle, whatever cruise speed is, it's not like it's 50% for sure. Okay, so just going along, level flight. See, it's roll. Oh, I might have finally found the middle because it's going too much now. But boy, I feel like we've got our rates. We've got our everything dialed in nicely. Granted, it's very calm right now. It's also very cold. Oh yeah, we're over our five minute timer too. So now we're into the uh, borrowed time, folks. How are we doing on that cloud cover with this white plane? You suppose we're gonna get any of that? I think it's okay. It'll depend on if it like blurs out around it. I'm trying to get so that your backdrop is colored full instead of white. Cause the white backdrop is what's gonna kill you on this. Yeah. Okay, over the tree line and down. There we go. Into the takeoff flaps. Out of the takeoff flaps, just fly it down next to the tree line. I think we should, let's try kind of bringing it around in a circle here and then coming back the runway. You want to step toward the center, about 10 steps. Perfect. I prefer to be on this side for when I'm landing this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, full landing flaps are deployed. You want to stay away from your tip stall, so keep a little bit of airspeed. Keep your throttle, Johnny, on the spot. You can't always go around, I don't care what they tell you in the training manual, because when you're flying EDFs especially, you're gonna run out of battery. Let's try that again. Take off flaps this time, a little more efficiency, I'm out of the throttle. About 5% throttle, just keep the EDF spinning, it takes time to get that going from zero to hero. Okay, full landing flaps here. Into ground effect, pull that nose up, then jank it, jank it. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> we used up the whole runway. I can't help but feel like at a minute 55, we're just a little bit over the loading capabilities. I didn't hear an alarm. Mm -mm. We have the alarm set to 3.6 volts, which is a little bit high for an EDF jet because you need a lot of draw to get that thing off the ground. I just haven't heard anything. So let's go ahead and double check. 3.7, 3.71, okay. So here we go. So guys, if it dies after this, I apologize. But we're gonna go ahead and take it up again. My hands are starting to hurt pretty bad. It's cold out here. You guys don't realize this, but when we film and there's like ice like this, it's legitimately cold, okay? It's not, it's not just for the camera, I promise you. Believe me, I wish it was just for the camera. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna come back around the eagle killing zone and then through by the house. Stay where you are, stop. Go back toward the runway, please. Thanks, perfect. Oh yeah, buddy. Sorry, okay. kind of tricked you with that one. Get it flying. Let's try another landing like that. Kind of janking it to use up energy. Probably 8%, 9%, 10%. Okay, 15%. Full landing flaps just deployed. That's why I'm increasing. Rudder to bring it around and full flare. Woo! See how it tips? Okay, let's try a short field takeoff because this thing seems to do well with that. We're gonna take off about like that, about 50 feet. Some of you guys have smaller fields to work with. We're on low battery and we're gonna take off right there and we're gonna go under the lines unless we can get over the lines. Okay. Woo, my fingers hurt. There we go. Okay, out of the flaps. Now I don't think you're gonna be able to land it there. Okay, here we go. Right up over the tree line. Okay, full landing flaps. Let's try a steep approach. Ooh. 
Kind of tempting to try to land on the sidewalk in front of us. This thing is so easy to fly. Let's try another landing this way here, camera crew. Okay. Getting way out there. Ooh, stay away from that tip stall there, Brian. Okay, here we go. I'm having to power it to get it back. There we go. Woo! So as you can see, this thing is quite easy to fly. There's not too many jitters going on. Oh, but my hands hurt. <laughs> Guys, we're at four minutes 44. I think we need to grab it. Let's go in and we'll check it. Okay guys, sorry, it was really cold. Our hands are starting to hurt. And all I can say is 14.8, 3.71, 3.68, 3.76, Now that's unloaded. Ordinarily, when we have that level unloaded, it should have beeped while we were flying. Because this thing is set, there's a little button right here. You can set that. If I had it set to 3.3, it didn't go off. Mm -mm. That's very unusual. I, yeah. I don't know that I've ever had one not go off like that. <clears throat> because at this point, yeah, see? Did you hear a beep? So these things are not impervious to failure, I can tell you that. Because look, it's currently set to 3.3 volts. It should be going off right now. So... There you go. Yeah. So you see what I'm saying? You could set it to 3.3 .3 and then throw give it, it throttle. throttle. Okay. See if it goes. Yep. <clears throat> okay. So I don't want to misrepresent the facts to you, but this thing is probably gone. So, and you want to know who used it last? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And you want to know who destroys his? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the battery we're using. So it's a 3300 4S. I felt like the performance is great. We didn't have any problems with it. Let's go ahead and plug this in. So, as you can see, we show a 12% remaining battery. Here's why I think it would have beeped, okay? My camera crew off camera while I was yakking there for a second. She suggested that if it's at 3.3, it wouldn't beep because it was a 3.7, no. Because when you load it for takeoff, it would have dropped down, Should surely. Okay. Unless this pack was really good. Now granted, this is brand new, brand new pack. It's only been used probably three times. So when you have brand new packs, they hold tight. So we'll see how this one holds up. Now ordinarily, we would test a plane on the smart pack. I'm still recommending the smart packs because we've had exceptional luck with them. That being said, it is kind of nice because these are a lot cheaper. You're not getting the smart data, so you're not trading off as much. Maybe if you're a new pilot, you go with something like this. Here's how you storage charge these things. You fly, and then you put it away. Mm -hmm. That's how you storage charge it. Technically, you want these at 3.8 volts. Okay, this one's right around 3.8 volts. No, you're not gonna get it exactly. And for those of you that don't know what storage charge means, lithium polymer packs, have a certain safe range where they have the, the least um, adverse reactivity, okay, below or above. If they're too high, over 4.2 volts, then they can actually start puffing and they won't actually behave well. The chemistry gets thrown off if you leave them charged for a long time, okay? If you leave them charged down too low, they'll just bleed off um, chemistry, the voltage that's in there, and then eventually, you're gonna end up, not like they're leaking, they just like literally lose the electrical energy that's stored because these things are like capacitors. There's four of them in series. Well, it's kind of like a capacitor, but anyway, the point is there's four of them. And that's why these things are soft packed. But um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit more about this in the Unbox Build Radio setup. Two ways to get hurt in the hobby. Don't cut your hands on the props, especially don't send me pictures of it when you do. Secondly, don't burn your house down with your lipos because those are really the only two things. And I'm not talking about burning the house down, but I'm talking about like sometimes these things uh, will throw smoke out and sometimes they'll catch on fire. It's very short lived, but if you have them in a bundle of 47 batteries, that's, that's where you get like a big fire. So just be careful the way you handle these, charge them on a hard surface if you got it. If you don't have a hard surface like granite 
or you know quartz or a rock or something like that something that you can get outside that's big that'll dissipate heat get yourself a handful of cookie sheets put them on top of something that's less likely to catch fire a couple of bricks whatever it is you can also do lipo safe bags which i trust them about zero percent um <clears throat> but anyway that'll give you some you know benefits we've we've charged literally thousands and thousands of batteries and we've done tens of thousands of cycles never had a battery burn ever and i've crashed them i usually take them out back and shoot them though just full disclosure when i get in a crash and they turn sideways and they bend like a j i take them out and shoot them with a 22 because it's fun and then smoke goes and it's really fun plus i can be a distant away and i don't have to worry about them exploding or you know throwing out a, a fireball because that lithium gas when it escapes it catches fire so not always sometimes it just puts out white smoke and you're done um, and it's really disappointing when that happens but that being said those are the two ways you get hurt in the hobby if you're not careful and that's part of the reason why we recommend these because they automatically go to storage level if you don't do anything after 72 hours i think is the default yeah 72 is default. you can turn that feature off and you can also set it to 240 hours which is what we do and that means we're going to get the least life cycle out of our batteries as compared to you guys that run a 12 hour automatic discharge so you know you're going to the flight field tomorrow you charge them up you give yourself a uh 50 hours so it won't discharge it won't start the discharge cycle until you know after you're done but the idea is you don't ever have to automatically discharge them and the number one way to to destroy a, a lipo pack is to just charge it full and leave it and then like use it next next season which is what i used to do and i used to destroy my lipos granted i was spending less than these cost but probably probably less than these too <clears throat> uh you could tell <laughs> And you didn't get near as long a flight time. I mean, that was an eight minute flight time and we technically didn't have an alarm, but I tend to think that this thing didn't go off and it should have. So that's one of the woes of the $5 technology, you know? So yeah. these things are really cheap and yes, they do go bad. And I'm going to tell you why they go bad. <clears throat> I have a friend who will rename, he, he will remain, remain unnamed, <coughs> Esteban, excuse me. Um, and he does this, he plugs them in backward and then that kills the circuit. It mm. doesn't do it on the first time, but usually after repeated, you know, like hundreds of times, he never looks, he just plugs it in. And I'm like, you're gonna kill that thing. And sure enough, they get killed. And yes, this one's been crashed a number of times, see? Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it just kinda is what it is. But these things are so cheap. You can buy like 10 of them for 30 bucks or whatever. So if you get, if you get a couple of them at a time, it'd be a good idea, cause you'll use them. Um, that being said, Love the way this plane flies. Very easy flying plane. Uh, it's not as rock solid as I thought it was going to be for a jet. In terms of when you're flying around, it's just very light on its feet, which is not what I'm used to on a jet. It's a good flying plane. It would be a great plane for a beginner, but you do have to be careful about the tip stalls. When I say tip stalls, I mean, if you bring a plane up like this, by the way, these are nitro gloves and they help keep your hands warm. And then when you come in, you take them off and you let them dry out, turn them inside out and use them again. Cause they're kind of expensive. It's like a mechanics glove. And that's what I do when I'm outside because it helps keep me warm and I'm not uncomfortable then. So anyway, getting back to the point, these things, when you go into a high alpha maneuver, especially with flaps deployed, you got a lot of drag and it doesn't matter at that point that your flaps are deployed because at that point, your whole wing surface is a flap like this, okay? So you're flying along, you're creating a separation. That flap isn't gonna do you any good at that angle of attack. So you could shut your flaps off if you know you're gonna be in a high alpha. So you, what you do is you fly into the transitional point with flaps, start bringing your nose up, and then you close, you, you put your flaps back to normal flight mode. Then as you stall, you're gonna have to put them back on quick to take off flaps and then give yourself throttle because it's gonna tip violently to one side or the other. That's what we call a tip stall. In real life, that's called a stall for full scale pilots. But in RC world, we call it a tip stall. So a normal stall, a nice nose down stall would be like this, okay? And it would just go down like this and then the plane would automatically start flying again. And what I mean by start flying is you gain enough speed to get controls working, okay? So when you stall to the side, the reason that that's more devastating to an inexperienced pilot is that they don't ever use this fancy little thing called a rudder. That rudder will save your life. In a real plane, it'll save your life in a radio controlled airplane. So you gotta use the rudder, get the nose going, 
get that thing so you're under control. And if it tips to the right and the nose goes down, just fly it, fly out of it, unless there's a tree there, <laughs> which is usually what happens. So anyway, without further ado, good battery, good luck, slightly better. You can buy both of these when you're ordering your plane from the links in the video description below. And uh, if you're curious about this, you can ask about it. It's called the XBC Battery Checker. We have like a smart technology link that's down there. I think it's like accessories or something. So, but then the NX8 has been great. Very happy with the AR630. Of course, it's buried inside there, so you can't see it, but it's mounted in and upside here. Mm -hmm. So that's really good upside down. Really good, really good. Loving this thing's been very good. Um, the only glitch that I'm annoyed with on this thing, out of all of them, is that my clicker or my spinner, like sometimes it will give me a bunch of false positives in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna take and clean that with some isopropyl alcohol and see mm. if I can help. But beyond that, very happy. Um, I would highly recommend this. Don't get the eight, or don't get the six, get the NX8, okay? And don't get the provided transmitter designed to AS3X and save. The one that it comes with has telemetry. So it's a very high quality receiver, but it gives you all the things you don't need. You need AS3X and safe. And plus those are not as expensive as the one that they're providing. So I would get an uh, Air 630 or a 31. So stay tuned, we're gonna unbox, build and radio set up this Marlin next. Thanks for watching. And if you wanna help support us without buying this thing, we also have Patreon and PayPal available in the links below. Patreon for monthly support, PayPal for one-time gifts. We really appreciate that, but we still think the best deal is to just buy the beautiful planes that you wanna see. Thanks for watching, come back for more. YouTube is Brad Phillips. <laughs> New box. You scared the cat. Did I? Yes. That was <laughs> Show the people. This is That's hilarious. Ash. He like freaked out. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, we were watching the cats this morning and they were uh, running along to and fro. And uh, I always think it's hilarious because one cat will sit there and then the other cat will go by like 150 miles an hour running away from nothing. And then the cat will just be like, what's wrong with you, idiot? <laughs> and then five minutes later, they switch. <laughs> but the one cat doesn't scare us. Oh my goodness, it's that far the airplane. Wow. This is the Arrows Marlin. So we're going to do this today. This is a 64 millimeter EDF jet. And we are going to put it together so that we can not fly it probably not fly it because the weather is terrible <laughs> so if you're looking for a good project to do all right so let's talk about the uh, specs real quick wingspans 900 millimeters overall length is 995 uh, flight size is uh, 1050 grams 2840 kv 3150 motor size esc is 40 amp uh, servos are nine gram servos there's eight of them because this does have flaps mm. So it's got flaps, ailerons, uh, must be, there must be a servo for each elevator side and then a rudder because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait, steerable nose gear. Oh. Uh, recommended battery is 4S 2200 through 26, 35C, and it's got a 64 millimeter 11 blade EDF. So that's pretty sweet. If you guys didn't know what that means, if you're new to the hobby and you're talking about different uh, Choice is this motor size. This has to do with the millimeters and millimeters. So 28 millimeters by 40 millimeters. So it's 40 long and 28 millimeters wide. And then of course it's uh, 3150. It's not kilovolts. Um, that would follow the word or that would be a, a suffix, not a prefix. This is thousands of rotations per volt. That's why it precedes the number. So thousands of rotations per volt. So if it is running at uh, 4S, and that would be like 20 volts. So 20 times 3,150 is the RPMs. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of RPMs. That's crazy. Yeah, so in an EDF, it's always about speed and movement. On a bigger prop, the speed makes it really hard to go up to speed because there's so much torque requirement. And so you create a huge current load when you first start them. So that's why you run an EDF really fast. Mm. Okay, cool. So uh, we've been super happy with the way arrows have come out of the uh, package. They've all been really well packed. 
Um, I like that we haven't had a lot of folded manuals, so I'm not sure where the manual is it's, yet in this it's one. It's folded. It's folded as I say that. Come on, man. <laughs> Here it is. So let's show the people. Let's just flip to page two. Yeah. I can't handle it can't anymore. It. It's driving me nuts. I hate straightening manuals. I'd rather it be like taped inside the box so I have to rip half of the front <laughs> off. Um, but anyway, so this is taped in kind of a weird way. So I'm just kind of fighting the tape right now. We love the way that these packages are coming anymore. We almost never see damage from, I mean, honestly, even some of the lesser known manufacturers have been doing a good job. So I don't know if it's just they're hiring better shipping people or they're using more foam or what the material is, maybe a little bit stronger, but we have just almost never get damage on ours. Um, we've had, I think there was one Banggood product we did a long time ago. We never actually reviewed it because it got broke twice in a row. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, nope, we're not doing that. And it was like broke, broke. It was broke, broke, like in pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think we ended up using you know, a couple servos or something, you know, to fix another plane once in a while. But I really like that plane too. I was hoping we could have reviewed it. Yeah. But anyway, so this comes apart. And that's one of the things we do here at Brian Phelps RC. We try to do an unbox build radio setup so that you guys can follow along, kind of make a decision as to what you think the, you know, your risk tolerance will be uh, as it pertains to an airplane. If you think it's going to be able to get to your house in one piece, you kind of know who your delivery people are. I think it's stuffed in there. Beautiful, yeah. solid. That's one thing I like. So if this was a dynam, that would have broken half doing that, okay? So as you can see, there's a nice big uh, carbon fiber spar right here. And you can kind of look at this, guys. This is one way to, to kind of analyze the plane. You can see these squares. These squares, that's probably where that is jigged into the mold, okay? So they have a jig they set up and they'll set this piece of carbon fiber down on it and then they close the mold, they fill it, and then of course that comes out. So you have to have a release so that they can pull off of the stand within the jig. Okay, so that's why there's always those holes there. But then also you've got the little mold release bumps and stuff all over this. The decals are really good. I like that we're starting to get the ball link on almost every plane. Big cheater holes here. Everything is glued together really nicely. Everything is smooth. Show them that. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. It's just a very, very smooth transition. Everything feels solid. Obviously, the ball joints are nice and tidy. And I like the fact that they're coming with all the surfaces almost perfectly centered, which is nice. Looks like we're just a little bit up here and just a little bit up here, but that could be just for me bumping it playing with it. But I'm really excited to see this. These aero servos have been nothing but, but good. These are analog nine gram plastic gear. Okay, so you're not getting Metal Gear servos. I do like the little sharklet on the wing. It's just a little teeny bit of a taper here. So that's pretty cool. I don't know exactly what that's gonna do. If that's just gonna pr improve um, kind of the auto leveling stability, um, I'm not sure. But I can't remember if this one comes with this it doesn't, doesn't have, the, have vector. the vector logo on the front. Yeah, this one doesn't have the vector. That's how you can tell is there'll be a vector logo. Mm -hmm. And so if you're getting this uh, with a vector sometime in the future, then you can run on a six channel like AR620. We're going to be using an AR630 because the 630 has end pins, which is nice in the jets. And also it is good because it has an internal antenna as opposed to the AR631, which has an external antenna. Now, Horizon claims that they have the same signal range, but if you have a bigger plane, get the one with antennas. I think it's like five bucks more and you've got top pins then. So like if you want the top pins and you're kind of toss up on it, it's really not that hard to hide the antenna. I just kind of like these for the smaller, tighter, compressed spaces because getting batteries into some of these EDF jets can be a pain. And our experience on Brian Phillips RC has been that when it is hard to load a battery in a plane, you don't use it. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, for me, I get home and I want to fly. And so, ooh, I want to fly. And if it's going to take me an extra seven or eight minutes to put a battery in, I'll lose my flight window. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's always going to be the case. Hopefully it's not. But right now, see, I'm, I'm really pulling on that. 
Yeah, it doesn't, this is not gonna crack or anything. But that carbon fiber, uh, it doesn't show up as good, but it's, it's definitely a carbon fiber spar there. Really good solid, nice finish. I like these matte mm -hmm. decals, they look really sharp. And the thing is, they're not like lifting on the edges or anything, so that's very good. We did a plane the other day and we had a prop, oh yeah, server on each side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so each, each elevator, if you had a ton of channels on your transmitter, you could actually use, on a plane like this, you have to think about, you've got ailerons here, okay? So they induce roll in the aircraft. Then you have inboard flaps, which uh, change the angle of attack so that you can look and see the runway better as a real pilot. And they also uh, reduce the stall speed so you can slow down without falling. And also they increase drag, which a wing that produces a lot of lift has higher drag uh, ratio. So when you deploy the flaps, you can change your angle of attack so you can point at the runway. Also, you, you increase drag so you can be going downhill and not gain as much speed, which is great. So there's lots of things that go on. But then back here, you just have two elevators that go like this, okay? So look at the way that these arrows, uh, servos are, are sitting, okay? So I wanna talk about this for just a quick second. These servos are going to be going in opposite directions. Because look, this one's gonna go. Mm -hmm. When you have a servo, they go a certain way. And so let's talk about that for a quick second. You see how these servos are sitting opposite one another? And these are also opposite one another. How are they gonna do that? I wonder if those are actually reverse servos. Because typically these would need to be mounted in opposite orientation in order to operate the correct direction. So I wonder if they just internally switch them because they don't have a different part number on this. It's an AHGGR or AH9GR. This one is an AH9GR as well, but it's not a reverse, okay? So what I was saying was, if you have a bunch of channels on your transmitter, you can actually make these act as a Televon, which would be really cool. And then you could do a full length flap, or you could do crow, which would be super cool, and there's zero interruption. You've just got a limited amount of roll authority, and you can do some really fun things. But for now, we're gonna do six channels on the day and show you just how awesome the Ford programming works with the Spectrum gear. And the reason I got all excited and sidetracked about that is because when you have these things back in the day, and I just got done answering some comments, we always reply to comments as best we can, and we pretty much hit them all, but it just takes us a while anymore. Um, back in the day, if you had an Air 636B, it was such a humongous, tedious pain in the butt to do any fancy mixing. You had to really get creative. These things are so nice. You set up your wing type right in the menu, and then later you go into forward programming as you assign AS3X to operate, and then later assign safe to operate within AS3X, okay? So it is so much easier. We're gonna show you that all in this, uh, in due time in the video. Obviously, you've already seen it fly because we always try to put our flights at the beginning, and sometimes we'll have some flights at the end too. Maybe if we flew in like extreme wind or something, we just didn't get a very good flight. We always want you guys to see these planes in a good light, not because we're trying to cover for manufacturers, because we don't really even care if they're garbage, we're just gonna tell you that. Um, but at the end of the day, man, that thing is cool looking. Look at that. Got a nice plastic tip on there, so it'll protect it. Nice, skinny, narrow body, that's mm -hmm. cool. And this is called a Marlin, so it's sort of fitting. I like the way that this fixed gear, I mean, I'm not a big fan of fixed gear, but I like the way that they put these two screws here. Now that is a little bit butt ugly, I gotta admit, this part here. But you know what's nice about that? I can unscrew one screw, take this off, belly land the thing, mm. okay? So I'm quite excited that they did it that way. That was really nice of them to do that. Um, also some cheaters on the top, that's definitely a good idea. And then let's give them a shot of the EDF before we get that all covered up. Looks absolutely gorgeous. Love the twin actual inlets here. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Very big, very clean. One of the differences I've noticed with the Aeros planes is you don't ever get this, this is always well trimmed here, which seems like it shouldn't be a big issue, but just believe me, it is. Very solid, don't have to glue this, that's yeah, super that's cool. Nice. And it looks, I mean, the tail is. That's molded in. as part of this. Yep, and then it's all part of this. Elevator. Yep, really easy. Three screws, brass nut zerts in there. 
Yep. Guys, we're getting so spoiled in this hobby. I mean, these planes are getting to be so much bigger, so much better. And um, I know some of you guys are bummed because things have gotten a lot more expensive. And to be honest with you, it's not really the RC industry's fault. It's kind of the world's fault. But um, man, they're just getting so much better. Just think about the quality difference between now and when we started this thing like six and a half, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, just everything is so much more better, so much nicer, so much smoother, so much tighter fit. Um, the wiring is cleaner. Everything is simpler. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't get crashed as easy, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. But, you know, that's you're going to have that. These are 1.7 inch, very firm, nice road pattern on there. I like that. But I don't like that they're not soft. Give us squishy tires. We demand squishy tires, RC manufacturers. If you can put it on that beautiful truck, links... Uh, back check out the video that was super fun we were driving that the other day uh, a few weeks ago and it was super fun we love that thing that's the glacier mm -hmm. uh, by easy rc but yes give us some squishy tires let's just show them an example here i know off topic okay look at this look at that squishy tire looks like you got a flat you know what's wrong with that why can't we have that in the rc industry why are we second class citizens in the rc aircraft industry we're tired of being second class citizens. We want our pneumatic tires, dang it. So anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna live with these for now. I mean, sure, we're in the air and we don't need the ground, but we need to take <laughs> off and we need to land. So I'll put you in later. Uh, what else do we have in here? Oh, don't forget the nut, nut and sack. bolt sack. It's right here, it's just, actually that's not too bad at all. The Camera smaller. crew, when she sees the nut and bolt sack, she always gets excited. There should be like six or seven, Here, hold right? that. Yeah. Doesn't that just make you Makes all my day. tingly? Makes me smile. Yep. You don't even have to handle too many of them. Nope. So that's great. Anyway, so we're gonna put this up. We're gonna put this up real quick. Basically, that's all you got. When we unbox a plane and it takes that long, and I'm in full-on story mode, it's pretty good stuff. There's because, literally. Look at all the pieces. Yeah. Look, it's right here. That's amazing. If this is a dynam, the whole island would be covered. Oh, no. And we would both be just like dreading it. The like, rest of my weekend would be ruined. So happy to be doing this right now. Oh my goodness, we need to clean our fan. That's disgusting. <laughs> sure, that's that with the world. That's why it's back there and I'm over here. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, so you see this Y cables? The plane will be so quick to build, you can clean that for me later. Oh, good. We're good. We just had some. You know, that's just like that weird glue stuff, I think. No, it's foam. There's a little bit of foam on there. Oh. Always double check. If it looks weird, get in there and look at it, okay? All right, so we've got that there. Now, the thing that's also very nice about this is if you decided you wanted to do some sort of a crow function here, then all you have to do is find the ailerons here, take out this cable. You can either cut the end here real close to that end, cut it, and then you can build a new end on this other side, or you can just unplug this and do two straight cables, and then you can actually do crow on this plane and crow would be where the ailerons act as flapperons or spoilerons in this case flapperons being ailerons that go up and down opposite one another or up and up as spoilerons down and down is flapperons and they keep acting as ailerons but then they return to a neutral position of flap or if it's a spoileron they go up and they lock into that position and they return to that position when you let go of the sticks, okay? So this would induce a roll, a roll, that sort of thing, okay? The, the cool feature of flapperons, spoilerons in conjunction with inboard flaps is that you can create tons of drag and you can make a plane that would say land at 30 miles an hour, you can probably make it land at 20 miles an hour. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. It's crazy how much slower you can get them to go. Now, that being said, you will eventually stall because the wing can only bear so much, but it's really cool. It's very fun to see that and it's very neat. Plus less elevator correction in that configuration. So anyway, getting back to the point, I get excited about small things. You may have noticed. Okay, so we got some Velcro. We're gonna probably do the shelf liner trick this thing's supposed to fly on 4S, so let's take a look at what batteries we've got to play with. Um, obviously the uh, Arrows, that's gonna be a 6S. We do have a 4S from Arrows. 
which is a 3300. Is that the top end of the size class? Yeah, I think so. Watch this when we put this in this truck, guys. This is so cool. Watch this. Oh, that is awesome. Just like a real truck. Oh yeah, like a rock. Like a rock. <laughs> okay, we'll put you up in the window. Lots of free publicity today for you. Um, we also have 2200 4S. I don't think I even want to try it with that. That's just too small in my opinion, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, and I did, you did say 35C, so that bigger one would be 35. This is, oh, that yeah. was only a 30C? That other one's a 25. Okay, all right, cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab one of these little adapters. These come with the Venom packs, like this. Mm -hmm. This is a Venom pack, a Venom Fly. So it's got the XT60 adapter. Now you don't have to use the XT60 adapter um, on the plane because it comes, did it come with an XT60? Yeah. In the, yeah, it came with a female XT60. But in this case, well, it's actually a male XT60. This would be like going into the plane. But then our smart chargers, of course, have the IC3. So this is gonna work for IC or EC3. And then they come with a Dean's adapter too. What else? They came with one other type of adapter, I thought. Yeah, I thought there were three, but I can't remember. So these things are nice because you can flip between the big IC5 and the IC3 with just within seconds, which is really nice. And so the charging procedure on a smart charger, since this doesn't know what size that pack is, you have to press and hold the play button and then change the current. Actually, four amps is about right, but I'll go ahead and click this. I like to charge at one, one C. So go to 3.3 amps, which is the same as 3,300 milliamps. Okay. And then I'm gonna scroll down to start. It's a 4S, it already knows that. And then when you hit start, it's gonna go, tell you the charge that's currently in it. And then if you press the down arrow, you can see what the cells are, which is right at storage level, which is really nice. We must not have charged that last time, which is great. So then the other size that we might consider using would be a 4S, oh, what, what do you think? 4S 3200 Smart Pack. So we've got this as 4S 3200. So it would be really close in size comparison. So I think it's kind of like a fair battle. Um, that does have an XT, an IC3 rather. So that will work with an XT60 uh, plug. So I'm just kind of thinking through the best thing you can do with your batteries for safety is to be nice to your connections and also charge on a hard surface. You see how this one's wanting to pull out like that? Mm -hmm. You gotta be mindful of that. Try not to let that happen. So if you gotta set this up on something, that's fine. Or get your, get your cables like this so that's slacked. See that? Okay, nobody ever talks about chargers, but where do we get hurt in the RC hobby? Lipos. And There's props. two things you'll get hurt on in this hobby, generally speaking, unless you're one of the, the one in a trillion that gets hit in the head at 450 miles an hour and gets killed, which almost never happens. I mean, it has happened, but it's almost, I think it's probably like one in, one in 50 million. So don't get cut on props. Don't send me pictures of your cut hand or arms or face or whatever it is that you got cut. Please don't send me those pictures. Just keep those for yourself. Last week we had somebody do that. Thanks, Big Jim, that was gross. Two, don't burn your house down, please. Be careful, hard surface, stay in the room. It's not that big a deal. If you have one puff, you'll be able to deal with it. It's never happened to me. And I have literally dealed with thousands of packs. If you burn your house down, you probably had something go wrong. Don't let it go wrong. It's not that big a deal. Just keep them in a safe area. You'll be fine. All right, safety, safety spiel done. You're adults, you can figure it out. Unless you're kids and then have an adult figure it out for you. I feel like there's like a thrust tube missing here. Is that normal? No, that's I right. I think so actually. Because a lot of times the thrust tube has like a decorative insert or something. So we were gonna stick the wing on when I got distracted. Do you want and a I, plane stand or tools or anything? <sighs> I almost feel like this one's just such a simple plane. I kind of like don't want to use a plane stand. Okay. We're going to use a plane stand. That's a good point, camera crew. <laughs> I like your idea because somebody asked me, this came up twice in the comments because I think on the Viper we just recently did for arrows, I had complained that I couldn't fit it on our plane stand. Well, the reason we can't fit it on the plane stand, so I'm going to just answer about 14 comments. And when I say 14, I mean like two, but it feels like 14. 
This thing is made by Robot. It's an extremely popular plane stand. It's been around for four million years. It was actually around about the time Adam and Eve were having, you know, their third child. That's okay? what they used for. They, build yeah, their they planes. built their radio control airplanes. Oh, you see how hard this is to adjust? See what I'm doing? That does not instill confidence in me that this is going to survive. Okay, so I just don't do it. And then you see how it's out of alignment now. So what you have to do is you have to kind of twist it until it is in alignment, and then it stays still. It's not that it can't be adjusted. It's that I don't want to put lubricant on my shaft in front of you all, okay? If you lubed it up, it would work. Well, I mean, it's usually the way it works. I mean, I just don't understand why. You could probably just spin it like this and you could actually wear out the foam a little bit. Probably. But I mean, seriously, and all, all joking aside, this plane stand has been awesome. It's worked great. Tom sent it to us a long time ago because he got tired of us struggling. And we used to use my wife's blankets, which I put a hole in with a P51. And you'll never, if you put a hole in your wife's freaking blanket, you will never, ever hear the end of it. No, because every night when she sits on the couch, to she'll watch be like, TV, I remember that day the little that you hole ripped in a the hole blanket, in me. We blanket. Let's the cold air through when it's like I know, 20 below. I know. So I'm just saying, word of wisdom. Don't <laughs> rip a hole in your wife's blanket ever or for any a new reason. One for Valentine's Day. Yes. So now that we've gotten our, is there any other marital <laughs> advice we want to do today? You see all these connectors, guys? That is a pretty tight squeeze. Serious law. Look at that. Ooh. Man, that is like way. I hope I can get it in there. Oh, it went. Okay. That actually was amazing. Once you got the all the connectors aligned, look how easy that went. Um, all right, I have some screws over here. Are all these screws the same length? I think they are. Wow, Ooh, they're they? making this super easy today. So we only have one, two, three, four, five here. Then it looks like the landing gear just go in without anything. So that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think they just clip in. Yeah, I think they're all, yeah. One, all two, same. three, four, five. Then I think we're gonna have two on the elevator slash horizontal stabilizer. Super easy. Looks like two millimeters probably. probably. So did Tom also send us these? Yep. Tom also sent us these nut drivers. Not, they're not nut drivers. Goodness gracious. What are, are these they? things? These are, like we, we, uh, we, uh, somebody correct me in the comments below. Tell me how to say it. We have used them forever and they are awesome. Very, very nice My set. Camera doesn't. I got a set of these things as part of a training course for one of my industrial scales that I support professionally. And I have it in the basement. They sent us like a seven, a nine, a 10 nice. and an eight millimeter nut driver size. It was just like a weird, you know, one of these like random kits they get you. They're like, you want to give you thanks for sitting through like a three day class or whatever, because they know you're going to be the one out there, you know, supporting their product, which is cool. And it's nice. The thing is, it's not my tools. So, you know, I already had all those tools. So I have it in a tool bag somewhere buried in a box from when we moved. How many years ago did we move? <laughs> Almost three. So whenever I get right. these tools out, I'm like, man, these are really nice tools. I'm gonna use those someday. How's that working for you? Yep. Still in the box. Still in the box. Sweet. Whoa, those things are way back there. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they're back there a ways. You hey, some no, I can get it. I can get it. No, they're both, they're right here. Look, that's not near as bad as I thought it was going to be. Huh. They seem like they're way back there, but I was able to reach them with my hands just fine. And then the ESC is right about here. Okay. So there's a lot of room in here, actually. I'm just trying to think where I'm going to put the receiver. I'm going to start thinking on that. While we're thinking on that, I'm thinking that we should probably put the landing gear on next. You know, the manual tells you lots of good things like how to put things on and what order to do it. But you know, when in doubt, just figure it out by watching Brian Phillips RC screw it up so you don't have to. Oh yeah, that looks good. Yeah. That looks good. I have one concern about these landing gear. I'm gonna talk about it for a minute, okay? If you have a plane like this, that is way behind the CG, okay? I'd like it to be at the CG or close on a jet, okay? Because if this thing doesn't roll well, which I believe it will, especially with flaps, the thing is probably going to take off like this. That's my prediction. Um, instead of taking off like this, 
where it goes up and then it's nose up attitude. Like the F-15 Eagle from E-Flight, case in point. Beginner, EDF, whatever you want to call it, 64 millimeter, not twin, single. And very fun little plane. Nothing as good as the Eros F-15, which is a twin 64. And by the way, beautiful, huge plane. You'll love it, but it is a battery eater. So be careful, get a 100C pack if you expect to use it more than a couple of times. That being said, beautiful plane. Mm -hmm. The F-15 Eagle, we're talking about the E-Flight, the wheels are too far back. So when you get when you get to wanting to take off, uh, it it just doesn't work. It won't it won't roll for you. So you have to be like basically full flight speed while you're on the gear, which is really hard on the landing gear. It does help plop it on the ground when you land, but I want the pivot point approximately at the CG. These, since they're trailing, it's going to be behind the CG. Okay, not a big deal. Definitely manageable. And I don't think it'll even be noticeable on this plane. They actually might be really close to where the CG is now that I stand corrected. All right, so let's do this tail. Uh, we got two elevator plugs. They are not indicated as to which one's which. It shouldn't matter. But I assume one of these would be a reverse. By the way, if you have a servo and you happen to have one go bad and you're like, hey, I'm going to use my Hextronic servo that I have sitting around from the, you know this crash plane, or you've got like a Futaba, or you've got some other brand, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You've got this, you've got an E-Flight servo sitting over here and you wanna use it instead of this one, okay? You put it in, it goes the wrong way. What do you do, camera crew? You can get a servo signal reverser. You could, except that your Y splitter is here and you've got a lead going all the way up here. Then you have to take it out and put... Take this out. out backwards. You put your new one in, you see if it's going the wrong way. If it's going the wrong way, what you do is you take this whole servo out and you unscrew the four screws on the bottom. The whole assembly slides apart like this and keep all the gears where they go. Mm -hmm. You're gonna desolder two of the three lines going to the trim pot and switch them. And it doesn't matter whichever two you wanna switch, you can switch any of them, okay? Once they're switched, switch the direction on the motor, the polarity on the motor backward, you're, you are using a reverse servo now. You can do that on almost any servo. That's how you reverse a servo. Well, I can't, but they can. Camera crew does it all the time. She's like, I want to reverse this servo so bad. And soldering is my favorite I come thing. home, <laughs> she's reversing servos. <laughs> can't believe you keep doing that. It's better than peeling all the plastic protective coating off of your electronics. Are you? Ugh. Quit plugging competitors. Okay, we've given you a great view of the wrong side of the wing here. We just want to apologize for that, as in the camera crew. She's so good. Okay, so brown goes up. This is quite awkward. Brown up, brown up. Okay, so here it is, guys. Okay, so there it is. All right, now that that's plugged in, let's hope we can get this through. I can't, so I'm gonna take the servo and very carefully pull this. Look. Ooh, that doesn't wanna move. That doesn't wanna move. It's hard on servos to do this. See? Oh, yeah. Once you get it moving, you can get it moving, okay? See, that gives me clearance to pull this under. Now, I have to try to slide this in, and in turn, I have to get that wire to, to not be slack like that. So what I'm gonna do is put the nose up here. I'm gonna find the rudder. Where is the rudder? Elevator, elevator, elevator. And I'm gonna just very, very gently pull on the elevator. See how it's pulling those two wires? See how it's pulling? Pull, pull, pull. Gently, don't unplug them. Don't unplug them. Don't unplug the Y cable. So now I just gotta figure out if I can take this tool and push that plastic so that it goes into the opening. And I think I can. Yep, one's going in fine. The other one's kind of fighting me though. Yep, there it goes. So now they're slid in there. And, I, and I'm gonna say that was the hardest part of this build so far and that was not very hard. I was expecting it to be kind of terrible myself. I thought it was gonna be really hard. Okay, so there's three screw points. You'll note that I turned this over to the side. I was talking about the decals not being lifted but on the back I just noticed that that was lifted. Not a big deal. All right, so now that we have that access, 
accessible. I'm going to take three of the four remaining screws. As per usual, they've given us one extra screw. I keep screws and other things in a perpetuity because you never know when you're going to need it. You meant all the things? Keep all the things? The things. All of them. Yeah, you know the thing. I know the things. The thing. It's they all always. Live here. Yeah. Still. We keep lots of things. You use them all the time. Listen, as no. soon as I get rid of it, I'm going to need it. When we moved, that was the truest it has ever been in our lives. No. Nope. I needed so much of the crap that I threw away that we had to feverishly throw away when we were moving. I don't know why I'm thinking about moving. It's been two and a half years. No. Yeah, stop thinking about that. That was a terrible experience. The only, it was I hate moving. horrible. People like me that are hoarders don't and move. do hobbies like this yeah. have a lot of stuff. The only time your hoarding has really paid off was when our garage door handle broke like in the middle of the night in the Listen, winter and you had an extra handle I had in the an basement. Extra handle, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You never know when you're going to need an extra handle in the middle of the night. Yep. At 11 o'clock. It was cold that day. It was, there was really like hard, cold. hard wind blowing straight through the door. I'm like, what is going on here? Are we in the twilight zone? Okay, so this, this, a ball end would be nice for this one, just so you guys know. But I think we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it work because I'm too lazy to go get it. Yes, I do have a ball end, but I don't have it in this it's driver like 11 configuration. 11 feet away. Don't you, isn't there? Oh, it's in, in the, the RTL, RTL fasteners kit. Ah, oh, dang it. Too bad, RTL fasteners, I apologize. We could have showed that. So anyway, as you can see, this plane is pretty much built. That's, That's crazy. Incredible. <laughs> that was, I mean, story time was like 10 times as long as build time. Um, like 35 sorry, people. minutes and half of it is just chatting. So I have other batteries too. I have 4S 5000. That's way bigger than they recommend. I have a couple other 4Ss. I think I have a 4S 3200 here. There's a 4S 2600 somewhere in here. Ooh, here's a... Oh, that's 3S. I don't think I want to push 3S. I think I want to go 4S, 3200. I just need something I can use for size and weight. Oh, I was going to say, why are you getting more batteries? Well, I'm getting more... I always... What I do is I get my batteries ready. And then if I really like flying it, I've got... Like the last plane we did was right here. Right. And then the last plane was here. And then like 14 planes ago was these. Over here. Yeah, and but... Sl slowly... Oh, geez. Man, that windsock is really out there. I don't think there. it's going to matter today. Yeah. Goodness gracious. It's terrible. Mother nature. More like mother lover. <laughs> that was really that dumb. That was really dumb. <laughs> so dumb. You need to edit that one out. <laughs> yes, please. Edit that one out, and you guys can stew upon what you missed. I can't find the 2600. Did I, like, crash a plane with the 2600 in there? <laughs> a 4S 2600? Yeah, 4S 2600. I got one somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Maybe it's a 3S 2600 I'm thinking of. Oh, there's, there's a 20. A, here's a 2700 4S. Oh, look at that. Okay. That's a super popular size. As you can see, it's perfectly Obviously. square. It never been used. <laughs> Maybe it was used one time. But we have different sizes so that when we have different planes that call for different center gravities, that's why we do that. Let's use this as our stand-in for now. Okay. So this will be approximately the same way. It's close enough for getting the mm. CG right. We do need to mark the CG, don't we? Uh, yeah, we do. But I mean, I got to get the, a lot of other things done here first. The battery straps on this plane are mid-grade. They are smooth. They do slide, which is good. If they don't slide, don't even put them in there. Manufacturers, please. That's a waste of our time if they're glued in there. Look at this. This one's glued in there. Dang it. I'm gonna have to break it free. Oh yeah, you want to know how many times I've broken a, I've broken the wood mm -hmm. many times trying to free those up, because if they're not free, you might, you literally just leave them out for us, please, because they're just not of any use to us. Because if you can't slide the straps, you can't put in a different size battery, you can't get it right. All right, so let's just plop this in there as a stand-in. Okay. So the first thing we do when we're setting up the batteries on an EDF is that we try to kind of figure out roughly where they're gonna go because the CG is so all over the place. Sometimes they give us like two straps and you're off 
the last strap and you got a quarter inch of it. And that's super annoying. I don't understand why the manufacturers don't improve on that process. But at the same time, we've had pretty good luck with arrows mm -hmm. having their stuff in the right spot. Yeah. I think we're gonna do the shelf liner trick quick. We've been having good luck with the shelf liner, except in our helicopters. It's maybe just a little bit subpar performance from what we need. And so this, this is literally shelf liner. It was in my shelf, but no, I didn't take this from under my shelf lined stuff. It just no, happens to be sitting in there. Someone was trying to get rid of it and then someone else rescued it from the garbage. Are you saying that I literally saved something and then used it? That's, you know, there's no. a lot of places in the world where that'd be called recycling. Well, not here. Upcycling, that's more exciting for some people. Can I ask a question? Yes. Why don't you take the sticky stuff off of that and stick it to the shelf liner and then cut around it? If you have good ideas, tell me before I look like an idiot. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> do me to edit that part out too. <laughs> yes, you could do it the easy way, but I like to show it the hard way because that way I get the fun of having you make a comment that well, makes you look smarter I than me. I thought that you maybe had Obviously. a reason that you were actually doing it that way. So you just thought I like had rationale for this, thought it through. Yeah. It's like, what do we have like a video board on this one? <laughs> no, oh, we that didn't. What we're supposed to do? Spoiler alert, we didn't. <laughs> Okay, Velcro, sticky stuff, okay? This, this, and this is not sticky, this is just shelf liner. So it's like the stuff that you put under your silverware or whatever so it doesn't slide when you open and slam the door or your children slam it hundreds of times a day. We just like it sliding around. Yeah, so it sounds like a car accident every time they open to, to get a spoon. It's like, are you guys okay? Oh, just got a spoon. All right, now I'm a little bit nervous the height is going to preclude us, but there is quite a big pocket in there. We might be able, I, it'd be nice to do it vertical. I don't know if it's gonna work. The vertical's nice because that gives us a nice convenient spot to put a receiver. That's why I'm pushing toward doing this vertical. If it doesn't work vertical, that's fine, but we may have to move it significantly back. So CG on jets or EDFs, particularly jets. Um, you want the CG to be on. You don't want it to be real nose heavy. If you're not using a stabilizer, tend toward nose heavy, but just remember that's gonna deflate your elevator. It's gonna make it work less effectively. So when you give full up elevator, it's not gonna be as much of a movement as if you were center of gravity is right because the pitch axis on the plane, meaning this, where it pivots, is gonna be in the wrong place, meaning you're gonna have more weight on the front. It's gonna want, it's, it's heavier on the elevator, okay? So if you have the center of gravity right, meaning you put the payload, in this case, the payload in this aircraft is the battery. Normally the payload would be the pilot and the fuel or the ordinance or whatever it happens to be. This payload can move back, which means the center of gravity is going to change a little bit. And then where it balances is what we need to get right. The reason you want the center of gravity back as far as you can tolerate as a pilot is so that when you come in to land a jet, you want to be able to flare and keep flying in a semi-stable fashion. Okay, but make no mistake, when you flare a plane, that is one of the most challenging points in fixed wing flight is high alpha, continued straight flight, yaw axis control so that you can keep going down a runway. It's challenging because everything changes slightly. Okay, don't freak out. It's not hard to get to that point. You just gotta get there. All right, so everything's in here. We probably could just see if this goes on. And it's probably, whoa, awesome. Okay, so it goes in there, no problem. And obviously the receiver is going to have some weight to it. And then there'll be some you know, tape or glue or whatever that holds this inside of there, but it's gonna be a very minimal consequence, like maybe 10, 15 grams. So now we can mark the center of gravity, but you can see we're already very close to where we need to be because we're about two thirds back on the wing, okay? So let's go ahead and mark the center of gravity. I can't believe how fast this plane I went know. together. This is kind of incredible. It it's gonna be like a 20 really minute good. video and two hours of me talking mm -hmm. endlessly. Is it, should we do blue? Blue, we could do blue. Let's do blue. Okay. 
Okay. I got red and black and orange. I don't think orange is gonna work very good. We should have a blue, right? Yeah, I have a blue in oh. my hand right now. So 80 Well, we could to do 90. black too. It's black and blue. Either Just one do black. would be fine. 80 to 90? 80 to 90. Okay, so calipers, leading edge. calipers are the easiest way to do this. You don't have to use calipers, but you can use calipers if you want. Uh, this comes from one of our subscribers as well. Thank you. Danny, you not Tom. You know who you are. Oh. So, so I'm turning it on. You can see the battery's about to die. What is it, 80 to 90? Mm -hmm. So 80, we're gonna have to get new batteries for this thing, probably cost twice as much as the actual There's device. One in the box. There's one in the box. Okay, cool. So 80.05500 is close enough. So from the, did they say from the leading edge? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so when they say the leading edge, it's always ambiguous because there's this like curved area. So I usually just kind of ballpark it. Okay. And no, you don't want to wrap the leading edge. You don't want to wrap the leading edge with like a flat tape. That is wrong. You'll get the wrong mark. It's an imaginary straight line to the point. Okay. It's not a wrapped measurement because that will take more distance than a straight measurement. Okay. All right. So 80 to 90. Mm -hmm. Wow. 10 millimeters. Yeah. That's a big difference. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of ballpark this again because you have to kind of, you know, line it up. And it would be nice if there was maybe a great tool that would do that for you, um, even better than the calipers, but we've been able to get it done. And so we try not to make too big a thing of it. This is where I make it ugly. And you're like, but Brian, that's super ugly. Yes. But you know, I've literally never gone downstairs and thought, oh, that plane has CG marks on it. I've never, never thought about it. I've again. never thought about it again, except for when I get a marker that has like a really fat tip on it, or like I don't quite make it into the hole, oh. or I make a mistake. But even if you make a mistake, what I do is I will take, what do we take? We take those uh, address labels and yeah. we'll cover up the CG marks mm -hmm. and then you won't ever know any better. The other thing too that you learn when you get into foamies is that foamies, foamies meaning foam built planes, where the primary media is foam. Um, they are amazing fun and they're some of the best flying planes you'll, you'll be amazed. And if you're, if you're into balsa wood, there's nothing wrong with that. And we do a lot of balsa wood stuff too, but you have to remember, like if this is the easiest way for the manufacturers to make them, then that's going to make it possible for them to stay in business doing this. Okay. Cause like they can do this or they can make that truck over there where they can hire some kid that could do that and have success building that thing 1400 times a day. Whereas this, you have to have some skill, you have to use glue, you have to get jigs set up right, you have to use ejection molding, and you have to do all that stuff exactly right. Whereas that's, you know, it's just simple stamps, they come out, they trim, you know, they run them on a grinder, they put them through a paint line. It's a really simple process. It's just a lot of steps, but it's simple, and it's cheap, and it's easy. This is not. so. You know, if you want to have balsa wood planes and kits, that's great. There's a few American companies that still do it. But at the end of the day, I believe that this is probably the direction that most of it's going to go. So like it or hate it, I love the fact that I can still get planes. And I also love the fact that I don't have to spend six months building one. Right. But I can still build one myself if I want. And there's mm -hmm. lots of outlets for that. So don't get down on the RC industry for that. Remember, at the end of the day, it's still a business. Somebody's gonna make money somewhere or it's not gonna happen. And if you wanna do it and lose money, then please do it and work with us. We will help advertise your product for you here on Brian Phillips RC as you lose lots of money. Um, so at any rate, we've got the center of gravity marked. Now let's see if it actually bounces. We love this hobby. We, we love the fact that there's still companies out there willing to make flying projectiles in today's world. Um, and that's just, we love it. So we want to support people in that effort. Are you adjusting your battery? Assignment? Yes, I am. I'm we grabbing. were nose heavy. Okay. That's what it looks like. I'm grabbing a remote. You know what we need? What? We need a black marker so we can mark what size battery we're going to use. So I'm just sliding my battery back so that the battery hits about the edge of the first strap right here. 
okay? Right there. All right? So then right here, we can slide that back on. Okay, cool. Oh, and then getting back to the business model thing. My whole thing is I wanna help our industry that we love so much to find some level of success doing it. If they can hit certain price points and keep people interested and keep people learning to do this, that is a win-win for everybody. I feel like we're still almost on the nose heavy because we're just centered here and we're like way nose heavy on the back. I'm gonna come off of the first yeah. strap already. See, if I go back any further, I'm gonna, see, I'm yeah. just out of the first strap. So let's say I'm out of the first strap. 30, 3,200 smart pack so far, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see how we look. And then I'll just show you exactly where my fingers are balancing it. See, still kind of nose heavy there. I feel like it just needs to be back further. You could, you could do this, but you see it's wanting to lean forward a little bit. If I went in the middle, it'd be nose heavy, okay? So something we talked about earlier was this. See this? See how that's there? We gotta go way back. Okay, now this, this is the bigger pack. So bigger packs, the payload tends to have to shift back. If you have a smaller load, you could bring it forward. Okay, because the smaller, imagine this, you've got a scale right here, a balancing scale, and you're trying to get it to balance. If it's real heavy, then the balancing point moves back. Okay, so you gotta slide it back. If it's real light, you gotta bring it all the way forward so you get to maximize the lever from the center of gravity to where you're going. So if your leverage point's out here, you need very little weight to balance this thing. If your leverage point is right here, you're gonna need a lot of weight, probably a twice as big a battery if it was sitting here. You're gonna need an eighth as big a battery if it's here. You're gonna need nothing because it's not on the plane anymore. But just imagine it like a lever, okay? So a lever, a simple machine. All right, so we got that move back. So guys, the more we know about the way our industry works, the better we can help make it grow. Okay, so that's still nose heavy on the, on the back hole by a long shot. Now it's just starting to get a little bit tail heavy on the front one. I don't think we're there though. I think we need to go back further. Really? Yep, but let's talk about this for a minute. Pause, not the video, but pause thinking about that. This is gonna get added and it's gonna get added behind the battery. It's gonna add some weight, things are gonna shift. Also, I have this big heavy lead right here that's going forward, probably weighs six, seven, eight grams. So I would say we put that all back, we're gonna be golden. But we at least know kind of where, we, how much room we have for the receiver. Yeah, now. and so that's why we do that exercise, guys. Yeah. Let's look again. You see what's going on? So we're gonna need, we're gonna want our leads to go forward because it's gonna be a pain to plug in otherwise. Mm, yeah. Excuse me, guys. So I think we need to probably go ahead and flip the battery, redo that same test, because if there's a big disparity in weight and balance, we need to fix that. Don't you think? Yeah. Okay. So the other thing we could try is now that we've done that. And so the other thing is for the record, guys, you know, sometimes we do these reviews on planes have been out for a little bit. This one's been out for a little bit. And uh, we really appreciate you coming here, watching our videos. And the way that you can help support us is by buying these planes from the provided links that we put in the video description below. Now, the way that works is that the companies we work with, they give us small commissions based on the sales that are generated through those links, okay? So it works out really nice for us because we love bringing the footage and you guys love the planes and we do too. And we genuinely love doing this. It's just that there's only so many hours and so many days and there's only so many good weather windows in the middle of freaking January and February mm -hmm. in Iowa. Look outside, there's snow on the ground. It's, it's terrible bad. weather, it's windy. You know, we try to do our best to keep footage coming out when it hurts to film. Okay, so we're down flat now. Let's see how that works. See, I mean, we got tons of room for that receiver still. Let's pop yeah. this out of the package here. Okay. The other thing that's nice about these without antennas, you don't have to worry about them breaking because they always tape the antenna down in the package. I hate that because then the, the antenna always gets caught. And I'm like, oh man, I guarantee you that nine ten out of 10, somebody's gonna yank it out of there and you'll ruin it because that's a coax. Oh, the only thing I don't like about that is mm. if this isn't on a flat plane, we may have to do a correction. And I don't wanna have that correction. You see what I'm doing there? Like wedging that out. If you're here, you're flat. 
That's gonna make your battery a pain every time. It's gonna make this not go in either. Yeah. But it is nice to have it in that spot. Boy, that would be super nice. But you're not limited at all on getting the battery back then. If you're sideways, you're fine. See right here is this point where it, stop, it stops going from tapering to the left, tapering to the right, you know? This is tapering to the, to the center. This is tapering away from the center. And then where they meet up is right where, right where we could potentially do that. Because then that gets it mechanically centered. But then all your wires. If I go back here, there is a correction for that though. There's two ways of correcting that. You can either correct, well, we could also go on the top. Upside down. Hey, that's actually not a bad idea. I wonder if we should do that. See guys what I'm talking about? Yep. Right here. That's the ticket guys. That's what we're doing. Okay, so pump the brakes on the video for a second. Let's talk about this. Why do we share all these steps with you? Why camera crew? Because is it because I'm obsessive about teaching people how to do this so they don't have to well, watch a future I video? Mean, that's part of it. But okay, I, I just mean, want to make sure we're on the same page. It's not assumed. Everyone assumes that people know how to do this. Yeah, that's what's terrible about always. this hobby is because they give us a manual that shows 14 steps and then it assumes 37 other steps. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's not terrible. That's just kind of the way it's always been. If you yeah. bought a stick built model kit, they would just say some experience required. Where do you get the experience from? Right. You get the experience from doing it. Well, you got to have somebody that you know. Uh, or a video like mine. So that's what we try to do uh, to help prop up the industry, help support it, because after all, we are benefactors of a winning industry, believe me. We want this thing to win because we love it and we wanna see more of it, not less of it. And remember, don't forget, we are competitive with all the other RC choices like radio controlled cars, drones, helicopters, boats, tanks, and we do some of those things, but what do we really do the most of? Fixed wing airplanes, because we love them. And it's fun, and it's a skill that is super um, invigorating, it's, it's challenging, it's something that can't be bought, it's rewarding, it's exhilarating, it's, it's not easy. Um, and if you can do it and be good at it in less than a couple of years, you're a freak of nature. So that's what's so cool about it. it takes. 100% uh, of your focus for a few seconds of your life. And when you live a life where you have a demanding career, you've got a demands from family, demands from finances, demands from you know, organizations that you belong to, churches, whatever it is, it is so cool to go out with a little chunk of foam and just be a kid again and get fully submerged into this excitement. And it is, it is, it's hard to explain that to somebody that doesn't get it. And the fear, the very palpable fear, the first time that you fly, it's, it's incredible. Cause you're like, that can't be that hard. And then you do it and you like crap your pants. And um, I say that figuratively, but there's probably people that have. Uh, it is a lot harder than it looks. It's a lot more rewarding than it looks. And it's just one of the best experiences you can do. And it's relatively safe. It's not as expensive as some things you could do. It's certainly not as cheap as other things you could do, but it is really fun. And you can do it intergenerationally with your kids, with your parents, with your grandparents, you know, you name it. It's super cool. There's so many positive things going on and really the barriers that are in your way of doing it should be broken down one by one until you're flying with me. So the next step is radio control setup. So we're gonna do radio setup because we basically have the CG sort of picked with enough adjustability because we have a place for where that receiver can sit. Yep. Now, but Brian, you were just talking about CG. You were gonna test it again. That is correct. We are gonna test it again. All right, so flip this thing over. You'll note that the landing gear are on. If you're gonna fly this without landing gear. Okay, so on the back holes, it's nose heavy. On the front holes, it's tail heavy. That's perfect. Fingers in the middle, it balances. Right now, it's probably about half. Could be more like four fifths of the way forward, two thirds of the way somewhere in there. It's kind of hard to tell with the pad of your finger because my finger is probably about 10 millimeters wide. So anyway, that's the gap. All right, so the next step in doing this setup is to use a transmitter like this and a receiver like this. If you use something different, you can make it work too, but this is what we're gonna teach you how to use today. This will eventually get discontinued and something else will replace it. If that's the case, my recommendation is to go to one of our most recent videos that is a plug and play. This is a plug and play. That means it comes with no receiver, 
no battery, and no transmitter. But it does come with a fan, it comes with all the servos, it comes with everything you need with the exception of those three components. Receiver, transmitter, they are sold separately most of the time, but you can buy these with the transmitter. I would not buy that one with the provided transmitter because it doesn't have AS3X and safe, but it has telemetry. You don't need telemetry, you need AS3X and safe if you're new. And then we added the battery. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So battery, receiver, transmitter, okay? Technically, this is a transmitter and receiver. Just to be clear, this is a transmitter and receiver because we do have telemetry data that comes from this and goes into that. And then this talks to this to tell it commands, which it then executes to the servos, okay? This is sort of a beginner-ish, maybe your first six channel. Um, it's actually not six channel because you've got throttle, elevator, rudder, ailerons, and then yes, your X controls. Flaps and flaps. So that's six, so six, but no, no gear. If there's retracts, then that'd be a different story. All right, so getting back to the point, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get yourself a programmable transmitter similar to this. In my case, this happens to be the NX8. We've used the NX6 previously, and then before that I used a DX18. Loved it, still have probably 98 models in it. Uh, very, very good. And yes, you can use them for multiple models because these are a pretty big investment. I understand that. It's very hard when you're new. Trust me, you need a good transmitter. If you're getting ready to fly planes, you will pay a big premium. And over the first two to three planes, you should have already made up your mind if you're obsessive enough to continue in the hobby. Mm -hmm. If you're on your second plane and you bought a ready to fly, good for you. Don't buy another ready to fly. Get a transmitter, get your feet wet. You will be amazed how much better this is. It's not a little bit, it's huge, huge. All right, back over here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit the back and cancel buttons, go to add new model. We're gonna create an acro. If that's not on there, you click and scroll. That's an acro, create. Once you're into the model for creation, takes a few seconds. We have the model select here, model type, we just set an acro. And then model name, if you change this after you build a model, it will reset everything, be aware. Okay, model name, this is where you type in the name. This is called the Marlin. It is a 64 millimeter EDF. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause and we'll do this. This is the legacy keyboard. The new keyboard's different, but it works the same way. We'll come right back. All right, so we get the Marlin 64 millimeter in there for the name. Typical to have some weird beeps there. Aircraft type. This is where you set up your aircraft type. So we have flaps, so I wanna turn on flaps. One aileron, one flap, but Brian, we have four servos. That's right, these are Y cabled together and Y cabled together. So the flaps inboard are one channel, the ailerons are one channel and they operate opposite one another. If you were gonna do flaperons, you would do flaperons. If you were gonna do dual ailerons, you could do dual ailerons and then make up a custom mix for flaps. Or you could do two ailerons and one flap. Excuse me, one aileron, two flaps, which would be weird, or two ailerons and one flap. That's what you would do if you're doing crow, okay? Or you can do two ailerons and two flaps, but then you've used four channels for just the wing. Then you need an elevator and a rudder and a AS3X on and off, so you'd be up to what, eight? And throttle. And throttle, mm -hmm. yep. So you can also set up elevons for the wing or for the tail, okay? So what I'm gonna do in this case is one aileron, one flap. Then just so you can see kind of what I was talking about earlier, just depends on how you have it set up. This would be like an F-14. See how it says Teleron? It's on the top, it's on the bottom. That's weird, huh. So there you go. So we could do that if we needed to, if we were gonna do all the separate channels. Of course, we're not gonna do that because it's not necessary, we'll just do normal. Then we're gonna script we're gonna switch. switch here and then go to another airplane uh, that more closely resembles the look of the aircraft. And this is definitely an optional thing. We'll put the Habu on there. Flight mode, uh, we have to do an assignment for flight mode so that we can turn on safe AS3X through this receiver in forward programming, which I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but there's a push button here, which does your binding. So you don't have to plug in a bind plug here. And then we also have signal plus and minus marked on the end. If you look real close there, you see how it says S plus and minus, and it's highlighted with some paint that's orange color, spectrum orange. 
Okay, so that's pretty cool. Wish everybody did that. All right, so because there's no retracts, I'm gonna make an assignment for safe on, safe on, AS3X on. And then flaps will be here. If we had thrust reverse, it would be over here. This is gonna be for expo and dual rates. This is gonna be unused in my case. This will be unused. If we had retracts, I'd put retracts back here. And then I would put safe off AS3X, something like that, okay? This is sometimes used for the Vario. The Vario is not supported in the AR630, but it is supported in the AR637T, not the AR637TA, that's a bind and fly model, okay? So let's set that to switch A and see how there's one and two and one and two, okay? So we're in one, which is gonna be AS3X, so you can change things here and do all sorts of crazy things. We're gonna come back to that spoken flight mode. This is where we type in what we want it to be. So double click the cancel button or the, the cancel button there, clears the screen. I'm gonna set this to AS3X. Okay, and there it is, AS3X. Ah, there it is. Okay. So then you can scroll all the way down and see this big long bar. We'll get all the way to the bottom, come right back. There's safe mode, but we need that for the other one. Yes, your X mode. Okay. Spoken. Flight mode too. Now we're gonna do this one is safe. Sensor aided flight envelope. Safe is not just a beginner mode. It is a mode with lots of cool technology to allow you to auto level the plane if you'd like, or lock it into different attitudes if you want. And the plane will basically keep up because it's one of the more sophisticated auto leveling programs out there. Okay, they're safe. See? Cool, so that's done. Channel assign, the only thing I know I wanna do is I want auxiliary two. I'm just thinking about this. Channel A is not necessarily gonna be attached to gear, but it is fine to use gear for your channel. But then I don't want this to be attached to B. So I'm gonna put it to inhibit. So there's no automatic assignment there. Okay, now we can walk out. Go to the main menu. First thing we're gonna do is set up throttle cut. Flip the switch, switch H. Move the stick, as you can see. Now it's working. You can see this down here. When I turn on throttle cut, it goes to minus 100. When I turn off throttle cut, it comes alive. All right, cool. So that's done. Dual rates and expo, real simple setup the way I do it. I assign it to switch F. <coughs> because we'll have a stabilizer, we don't need tons. 10, and then 20, and we'll drop the rates down to like 90, okay? So that's what we're gonna do for ailerons, and we're gonna mimic that exactly for all three of the flight controls, primary flight controls, which are pitch, yaw, and roll. So this is, of course, pitch through the elevator. Cool, and then rudder, switch F. And if you can't tell what I'm doing, I'm assigning this to, instead of being on, I want it to be corresponding to what the F switch does, okay? And just the ability to be able to flip a given switch and make an assignment is huge. Makes it so much easier. Okay, so now no matter what setting I'm in, <clears throat> I have an out. So if we take off and we don't have enough expo, I can go like this. If we have too much expo, I can go to that. When I land, that becomes the new middle. <clears throat> Ordinarily, this is what we need to replicate. So I realize I need a little bit more expo on the middle. So this will become, say, 30. And then this will become 20. And then this will become 20. 
and then this setting will become double whatever that is, okay? So the new normal is whatever you land on your maiden, you feel comfortable, then go ahead and make that the new normal, then give yourself an out up and an out down, okay? Okay, so out of the dual rates and expo, throttle cut's already done. Flap system, let's turn that on, attach it to B. I don't know what direction things are gonna go, but usually it's like minus 100, plus 100. This is actually a flap, it's not a flap on. Flap on usually operate within half of the range. Spoiler on, you operate on the other half of the range. Okay. Then we wanna do an elevator correction. <clears throat> let's set it to like six and 10. That'll be a good starting point, but it's not necessarily gonna be exactly right. We'll have to play with it. And let's set the speed to about two seconds. Then you can see the flap moving and the elevator correcting. <clears throat> Okay. And that happens at the same rate too. See how the flap in the elevator moves? It takes two seconds or whatever. You can change that speed even slower if you want. If you can't figure out your ballooning, sometimes just changing the speed greater will help with that. So if you go to like four seconds, then that means your plane has longer to respond in terms of slowing down before it has a chance to like balloon off some of that speed. Because putting down the inboard flap <clears throat> will create a tendency to want to balloon and go up, at least on an inboard flap with this type of wing and body style, okay? So what you do is you counteract that balloon effect with the elevator. The thing that's nice about that is then you automatically decrease speed when deploying flaps. If you wanna deploy them slower, then the transition from full speed flight or half speed flight to whatever flap speed flight is gonna be will be less aggressive. The transition period is where the balloon occurs, okay? In a real plane, there's no elevator correction on, you know, well, that's not true on big planes, on big jets and you know fighter jets and things like that, everything is computer controlled. But on a simple plane, like a stole plane that you're gonna fly out of your you know, acreage, like we're gonna do back here when we have enough money to do it, that plane is not gonna have any elevator correction that isn't right here on the stick, okay? So you're gonna deploy them and that's the way it is. And whatever balloon happens, happens, okay? So on a radio controlled airplane, we have mixing. All right, so then the last thing we have to do is telemetry and stuff that's gonna be done and forward programming. So we're at the point now where we can go ahead and clear the timer. Let's go ahead and set that up. <clears throat> If you choose to use an AR637, you'll have an extra wire that plugs in and it goes in the side. And it looks like a 1S micro pH connector. And then you can run that out and plug it into your battery lead that goes back to your ESC. And then that will send voltage via telemetry to your transmitter. <clears throat> we don't have that. We have the AR630. So we have voltage on the BEC, which is because we know what it is on this thing. We don't know what the voltage is on the ESC because that's not part of this electronic circuit per se. The BEC takes power from the battery through the ESC that's part of the ESC circuit or a separate BEC or an SBAC, uh, a, switch, a switching BEC or a UBAC, uh, which uh, I forget what the UBAC stands for right now, but the U part. But either way, those are many times separate if you have twin EDFs or a hydro circuit, or if you have four engines, then you have four ESCs and then you can separate that. So you have one BEC that acts as the battery eliminator circuit to run this thing, okay? That's what energizes this, okay? So, but it is not aware of what our battery voltage is. So we have to use a timer. So the timer in this case, I'm gonna set it to five minutes or did they suggest something? They in the did not. Okay. So we're gonna go five minutes. We're gonna do a one out. That means that anything over 25 in this case, it's gonna start counting. I'm gonna clear all this stuff, except for the countdown. I want it to be in words, voice, and then I want tone and vibrate, and then every minute we want a tone thereafter. A lot of the stuff that we set up, by the way, I just need to tell you guys this. If you get a programmable transmitter, you can set a lot of the stuff as defaults. You can make a template and you can start from a template every single time. But I find that it's so easy 
to do this. And for me, it will take five to 10 minutes when I make a new model. It's not that big a deal. And then you're intimately familiar with what you set for that particular plane. I have so many planes, I can't keep them straight. Please don't ask me what the setting was if I just showed you, because I don't know. I, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I just don't know, because there's hundreds of them. So if you just go back in the spot in the video where we were flying and I made some adjustments here and there, which is, this is a good point to bring this up. I will probably make adjustments to a few of these factors, namely the flap to elevator deployment. That will probably change. Also the master gain on the AS3X, which is gonna be assigned to this channel here, okay? That is what's gonna happen. So you need to be aware that when we make an adjustment, the adjustments are gonna come before this chronologically in the video. So if you're seeing this and you're copying along, good for you, do that, it's good practice. But you may have to go back and watch the end of the maiden flight or the end of the second flight. And occasionally we do like three or four flights and they do occasionally get put out of order. So I apologize for any inconvenience or confusion that may cause you. We're trying to kind of lend this uh, to a beginner pilot because I feel like this would be a good beginner choice or might be a good beginner choice. I haven't made my opinion because I haven't flown it yet. Once I fly it, I'll make that decision and then mention it in the flight. All right, so at this point, we're ready to start plugging things in, which means that we need to mount the sucker. And obviously we don't want it like this, so all the wires you know, are sticking out. We want it back like this. And you're like, but Brian, that's upside down. How's that gonna work? That's true. Upside down would be a problem with some receivers, not this one. The only thing you can't do is put it sideways like this. You can go flat this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way, this way, this way, or this way, but not any of these ways, okay? Lengthwise is not appropriate. I don't know why, and to be honest with you, shh, there's a dirty little secret. You can still do it. You just have to trick it. Oh, really? Yep. You have to change your yaw axis and your roll axis oh. and your pitch axis. It's not that big a deal. Anyway, we're gonna do it this way. So don't tell Horizon. All right, so here's the thing. We had to do that with a lemon receiver a long time ago. In fact, it was in that big brother for that uh, Boeing 737 MAX 9. Oh, really? Yep, it was on the Airbus A330-600. I don't remember yep. that. I remember that, just not everything. Okay, so this is the flaps. Now, how do we know how to plug this in? We're gonna scroll over one click and it goes to monitor. One, two, three, four. Uh, there's the flaps, okay? So it looks like it's on one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. It's numbered right there for us. And of course the brown is down. So brown is down. If you're not willing to build a plane like this, um, <clears throat> this is a pretty easy build. You're probably in the wrong hobby, but I understand your reluctance to want to build your first plane because there's a lot that you can get wrong. And uh, honestly, I, as much as I love the flight test guys, I always felt like, you know, the concept of building a plane from scratch to fly it is so daunting because there's so many things you have to actually get right. If you buy one of their kits, good for you. They're awesome and they are great trainers and good teachers and advocates for the hobby. I love those guys. But I always felt like it was way too much to ask a beginner pilot. Just get a bind and fly and just do that. Learn to fly. Learn why you want to do it. Why do you want to learn to do something before you know that you want to do it? That's what's so cool about this is that you can get into this hobby now with such a low point of entry and then you can figure out, oh yeah, it is worth investing some time and manpower um, to go ahead and learn this new skill of you know, setting up a programmable transmitter, for instance. Okay, throttle. Throttle is on channel one. The first. Oops, that's not channel one. That's channel two. The first plug and fly you bought. Oh my goodness. What? Going from bind and flies to the first time you opened up a plug and fly and it's like, you have to like plug all this stuff in and put it all together and. I don't remember it being really hard for me. Well, I mean, I don't think it's hard now, but I've watched you do it 27,000 times. I don't know if it's quite that many either, but. 26,000 times. Okay. Okay, where's the rudder? Oh, there's the rudder. Okay, so rudder. It does look overwhelming when you're first new to the hobby, but it's like actually pretty simple stuff once you start doing it. And you're like, well, why is there no plug there, Brian? Because that's the bind plug and also a way to program the receiver should you need to program it, okay? And when I say program it, I don't mean forward programming, which we'll do from the transmitter. 
Uh, also, there's an unplugged plug right there on channel five, but channel five is gonna be used for controlling our AS3X. Mm -hmm. We're also gonna use these channels to do some more controls. And you're like, but that's a six channel receiver. No, wrong again. This is a six channel receiver plus. You've actually got controls above the six channel, which is what's so nice about that. So anyway, just, just to clarify, uh, there's hidden channels above on these. Um, okay, so you see how there's some extra cable here and there's some extra cable here. We don't have much cable management to do, which is awesome, love it. I'm gonna stick these cables into a bit of a bundle here and I'm just gonna figure out a way to get those back so that they stay nice and tidy and I don't have to deal with them later when I'm like trying to hurry to get a battery plugged in. Now I wanna see if I have enough length to be able to even get that into position, which I do. Awesome. And I'll be able to hit the plug. Now you could leave that sticking out if you wanted and that'd be fine because I believe the canopy is gonna, I don't, uh, that might protrude down past. See? Yep, mm -hmm. it does. It goes down past. So that has to be flush. It's gonna have to all the way be back there. Okay. So I think in this case, we could do hot glue here and it would work fine, or we could do double-sided tape. What do you think? We could also do Velcro. Double-sided tape or Velcro. This is kind of an awkward spot to get to. Too Velcro awkward. would be nice yeah. because if, if you have to get in there and work on it, I don't want to have to rip it out with hot glue and all that all over it. I think it. it's going to be an awkward spot to glue too. Well, the hot glue would be pretty easy. You just glue it and then you just stick it up in there. But I don't want to use, well, you could use China glue because China glue would probably work good, like mucilage or foam to foam. Really? You, yeah, you can actually use that. But I think Velcro might be the better option. And as mentioned earlier, I hoard things. So I have some Velcro in here that's <laughs> like left over. God forbid I would throw anything away, that would ever. Be terrible. That'd be terrible. We'd probably gain like hundreds of square feet of space. So these are Velcros that came with other aircraft. And I kind of don't like the idea of putting Velcro on my batteries. So I end up with a lot of extra Velcro, but it's usually one half of the Velcro. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Like a few of these Velcros, they actually are, I, this is just how much I keep everything. Look at this. I peeled it off of something. No, let's not use that one. Let's see if this one works. Nope, that's just one half. Ooh, that's both sides. See, both sides. Looks like about the right length too. Yeah. So then all we need to do is just take that Velcro and just do a little something like that or like that. I would say like that. Mm -hmm. That's probably good. So I'll just cut it. So just cut it with the backing on there. Make it easy. You could do several more pieces of Velcro. Thank goodness. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, that was a close one. That's really close. We almost used up a whole thing. I know. Okay. So there's some Velcro. So we've got kind of the firm and then we got the fuzzy side. I don't know which way is going to be better, but I'm just going to stick them together. And then go ahead and come in here and do this. And for those of you that are thinking, but Brian, you trust your plane to that Velcro? Yeah, pretty much. Now, if this is like some $2,000 plane with an, you know, a jet engine on it, I'd probably be a little bit more inclined to have a higher level of security on the mount. But honestly, we just don't run into problems with this. We've done it a number of times, had pretty good luck. So what we do is we, we, we just want to make sure it's nice and square and centered. Okay. So this also gives us the ability to center it. And you'll see that I'm grabbing and squishing that in there hard. Mm -hmm. That's so that we get it in there square. And if it's not quite square, we can actually pull the Velcro down now like this, yank the Velcro like this, and then I can get it out and work on it, which is real nice. And then when I'm done, I just have to try to get this in here nice and square with the plane with the length of it. Okay. I feel like we've got it in there nice and square. That seems good. Okay. So we've showed you guys a million different ways to mount these things. There's not like a wrong way versus a right way in this case. It's just more of, you know, like what do you have lying around in your kitchen while you're building your airplane for your YouTube channel? That nice. fits good. I like it. Let's check the CG. Oh yeah, tail heavy, nose heavy. I like it. That's perfect. If you're between the two points, you're good. 
Now the rudder's turned, it's gonna be of a very minimal consequence, so I'm not even gonna write that into the equation. Let's go ahead and look at, let's look at binding this thing now. So throttle cuts on first, got the plane ready, everything's done, we're gonna power this down, okay? Why are you powering this down? You could leave it in and go to the bind mode. Sure, but it times out so quick, it's not even very practical when you're filming. So I'm gonna press and hold this button, the bind button, while powering it on. But I have to get this battery plugged in first, and so we're gonna pause, clean up, and come right back. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and plug in the battery now so that we can get everything closed up. And I uh, actually don't need to close it up. We're just gonna do this. Okay, so this is an IC3, this is an XT60, they will go together. Oh my goodness, that was a fun one to get together. Okay, so now this is not bound to anything, so as soon as you press it, you see a flashy light. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna put this in position so it's easy when I come back, I'm gonna press and hold this button, and look how far away I am, guys. I'm gonna press and hold this button, then let go. When it starts, it says binding. Ha! Bind failed. <laughs> so I'm telling you, if you do this on camera, it then works. it'll always fail. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click, scroll down to bind, bind. bind. Got it. Yep. Okay, so everything came alive. Okay, so it looks like Ailerons, elevator, rudder steerable, takeoff flaps, landing flaps, awesome flaps. Okay, cool. So at this point, we can go ahead and plug this in. Oh, you know what we never did, guys? We Before we forget, I wanna mark this. This is a trick that we've been doing for years and it's been of such great benefit that we have to share it. And that is we forget what size batteries go into what size planes. So I'm just gonna write 3,200 um, milliamp hour. Uh, that's a 4S, okay? And then I'm gonna draw a line. That's where the front of the battery goes and that's the arrow to indicate where the wires come out, okay? So then I don't have to remember that in like six months when we're getting ready to fly this, uh, you know, for one of our spring flights, okay? Just plop this down in here and that works really nice. And then also, if you weren't already aware, there are a few rules that you have to follow if your plane is over 250 grams, but you're big boys and girls, you can figure it out. I'm sure it's a stupid rule, whatever it is, but just don't do anything too crazy. Follow the rules if you don't wanna have trouble. All right, so if you look at this, elevator up, elevator down. Roll left, roll right. That is incorrect. Y'all left, y'all right. Looks like the steerable nose gear is working. Take off flaps, landing flaps, corrections in the right direction. So what we need to do now is we need to do a couple of quick things. First of all, we need to go to travel, reverse, ailerons. Roll left, roll right, call it out. Don't, don't do this. Look, look, it's working. No, you don't know if it's working. Aileron's going up, aileron's going down. That's gonna force the plane to roll, okay? That's gonna force the plane to roll. Move the transmitter, get in the habit of doing it. Elevator up, elevator down. Y'all left, y'all right. Get used to the practice. I see a lot of guys, they do. It's working, it's working. Did you see, could you tell if that was yeah. working? You're gonna crash into a tree, I promise. Okay. And sit where you can see. Don't sit where you can see. Line up, line up with the plane like this. We don't do that by accident. We do that on purpose because this next setup is gonna be dependent on you getting it right. If you get it wrong and then you're heartbroken and you just blew like 400 bucks or a thousand bucks on the crash, I'm gonna feel bad for you, but there's nothing I can do to help you get that back, okay? So here's the thing, also, there's another servo adjustment I need to make on the flaps. See this? See how when they're stowed, they don't go all the way up? I'm gonna take that 100 and make it bigger. See how it's going up? Cool. Now it's nice and level. That's pretty good right there. So I'm looking for the gap right here. So about 125, let's call it, just for easy figuring. Then takeoff flaps are way too low and landing flaps are 
Awesome. Those are crazy. Those are barn doors. Love it. Okay, so then let's go back to flap system and make that adjustment. So the first thing is take off flaps. I want to take and bring them quite a bit up. See what I'm doing? I'm just kind of scrolling as I look. I'm just over here looking as I scroll. I don't even look at the number. I don't even care what the number is. It's irrelevant. So I think that's, that's about what I want. What are you looking for when you're setting takeoff flaps? Um, depending on the type and speed of the aircraft, I want to induce less drag but increase lift. So I'm looking for about a third of travel. And then if I can get a barn door for landing, that's good, especially on a jet because they're so fast. That might be too much, but I'm going to go ahead and go with it. So minus 100, minus 50, plus 100. Two second, six and 10. So the elevator is going to go down and the elevator is going to go down even more. Okay, watch this. It's very subtle. See it? Very subtle. Okay. But then this keeps working. Do it again. I'll hold super soon. Here. Okay, you guys see that? Take off flaps, landing flaps. Take off flaps, landing flaps, okay? Does that make sense? That's a subtle correction. I think we're probably gonna need more correction on this plane. I don't know for a fact. I think our takeoff flap deployment's probably a little bit too much. Again, we'll take it worth a grain of salt right now. We don't know yet, okay? So elevator up, elevator down, roll left, roll right, y'all left, y'all right. And for those of you that like our three hour videos, give us a like, please buy the planes from us and the links that we have in our video description below, buy the transmitter, buy the receiver, buy the batteries. We will link, uh, Eros has been great to work with. If you hate this plane, if you think it's the most ugly thing you've ever seen and you don't like it, we have many, many others. We don't, we're not trying to tell you to buy something you don't like to support us. We're telling you that when you decide to buy what you love, and we helped you make that decision, support us by buying it from the links. That's the way you can support us. We do have time to make three hour videos. We, Except we don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's inside joke. So anyway, um, getting back to the point, the next thing we need to do is we need to do forward programming. So now what's forward programming? Forward programming is where we set up AS3X and safe. Forward programming, there is a connection between here and the receiver. And gyro settings. First time setup. You have to have all that other stuff done first. Make sure the model has been configured, including wing type, reversing, travel, trimming, etc. before continuing. I'm gonna see if I can put this down here. Then I can click and it says gyro settings. First time setup, click. <laughs> Next, okay. And then basically it's just warning you that you have to have everything set before you do it again. Okay, set the model level and press continue. So we're gonna do this. Now you have to lift it and put it on its nose and then do continue. So highlight the continue so that it's ready. Then when you set this on its nose, this is easy with a small plane, but it's not easy with a big plane because we've done some big planes and it's pretty awkward, okay? Remember, this isn't like GPS. It's just trying to figure out what direction you mounted the, the receiver. I'm clicking continue. It says standpoint. Look at that, cool, orientation three, continue. So let's go ahead and verify that that's right, because what do we do? Just like Reagan said, trust but verify. We are going to trust that this worked, but verify by looking. Trust but verify, okay? Up you go. This is up, okay? I can't really tell where the pins are, but I believe those little lines show us that the pins are there. Okay, we're gonna verify even further this time because it's hard to tell with that image, mm -hmm. okay? We're gonna test the AS3X shortly, like we always do, so that will verify, okay? So we're just gonna continue, so you can scroll down to continue. Gain channel select, okay? So we're gonna go to, we want gear. This shows you what's available. So I'm gonna go here, and I'm gonna go gear, and it already says input A, next. Then we go to apply. Radio flips on and off, reboots, one dance. Yep. Two dances. We heard one dance, that means AS3X is active. But AS3X is only active after we give 25% throttle. So, nothing. Watch this, throttle cuts off. Whoa. 
That's good power. Wow. Throttle cuts on. <laughs> now listen. Okay, so everything is on, but we don't know if it's working in the right direction. So that's our next big move. We're gonna click. We're gonna go down to Ford Programming. We're gonna let things initiate. We're gonna go to Gyro Setup. Yes, 3X settings. You can change your gain to two or four times. We start in one, we've had good luck, but for the sake of the video, we go to four times for you guys at home so you can see the S3X gains. These are the defaults. Many times we adjust these. You need to get a different angle so they can see. Many times these change, okay? There's also safe mode, safe mode that will change and they will be tied up in the safe menu, okay? Flight mode setup. Safe mode. Okay. Mode. It doesn't see a change. There you go. Safe mode. See how that's changing now? If you didn't set up a flight mode earlier, this won't work. Now let's go to first time safe that safe setup. It's already set. Continue. Safe. That's why I want it to work. So I'm going to go to next. Don't worry about all this crap. It's just going to explain stuff. This is where if you mounted that receiver, instead of being flat with the plane, if it was up at a slight angle or maybe kicked at a slight angle, you can correct for that. I would not recommend it. Make it straight. If you can't do it and it has to be at a slight angle, this is where you correct for it. It, sh it shows you right there what to do. Okay, so I'm gonna do next. Okay, so we're in flight mode three versus flight mode one. We set up that audible alarm. It's not set up in this menu. We did that earlier. So it means nothing to the actual performance of the aircraft, it's just audible for us. Now we're gonna make everything match. So in this mode, I want safe on. So Self-level self angle demand. Or you can do flight envelope. Okay, I'm gonna do this. There's your angle limits, okay? Apply. That means you got safe on. Not on, but active, okay? So now we're gonna click to reboot. We're gonna walk out of the menu. Okay, so let's look at this. You got the plane here, elevator up, elevator down. Roll left, roll right. Take off flaps, landing flaps. Everything is still working. Yaws the right direction. And guess what? Now we have safe on. How can we tell that safe on right here? If you flip, you'll have more output. Safe mode. Pretty big, big difference, change. right? Okay. Now roll. Safe mode. AS3X mode. Safe mode. That's one trick. The other telltale sign. Now, AS3X is not active, except it is, sort of, because it's doing safe. Trying to find the quickest route to level. That means you're getting auto leveling. Look at the elevator, the elevator's up, now it's level. Nothing, and no dance, nothing, okay? There will be some now, you're welcome. You. Throttle cuts on, elevator up, elevator down, left, right, up, down, also up, down. See what I did? Come over here, guys. Left, right, up, down, up, down, up, down. That means we're correcting in the right direction, okay? That's the most critical test you're going to do. That and then making sure that your inputs are commanding the correct direction of flight. Okay, so now, why is this helpful? Why do we care? Because if you have this thing going along and it corrects in the wrong direction, the first time the wind blows you, it's gonna induce a roll and you will crash. Yep. You will absolutely lose control unless you're an exceptional, very, very good pilot. Your brain will not, Your brain will not that catch fast up. backwards. Okay, we also don't have the gain set up, so we gotta set that up now. So let's do that next. Click, scroll down, go to forward programming. Connecting, throttle cut is on, gyro settings, 
system setup, gain channel select. Auxiliary three. Auxiliary three. Auxiliary three. And then you can set the safe stuff too. Auxiliary three. Auxiliary three, okay? Let me walk out. All right, so now watch what happens. Same amount of wiggle. You can hear there's a difference because there's no correction now. Now there's a ton. And I'm trying to do this in such a way that you guys can see what I'm talking about. See, watch it. I'm gonna try to wiggle the plane, come up here close so they can see. Off. On. Does that make sense? So, a little bit of throttle. Let's see if this thing will float. I don't know if it will. Okay, we're currently in AS3X. Pretty close. That's pretty close. That's pretty good. If you had a smaller battery, it'd probably have a one-to-one. One-to-one -one power to weight ratio, meaning that it would be able to float. Okay, so we have all the settings set up. We're not ready to fly because this setting is too great. It's going to overcorrect and I 100% guarantee it will oscillate. My objective is to get this knob so that it's in the middle, okay? So right now, this is way too much correction. This is too few. I want it somewhere in the middle. So I'm gonna set it to one ax but it's harder to see on camera. So we always do that for your benefit. If you need to make this change, all you have to do is click, scroll down to forward programming, connecting, other settings. Oh wait, sorry, it's under gyro settings, under AS3X settings, and there you go. Okay, so there's one. Now, if you had enough channels, you could actually set up sliders here and here, and you could do gain for yaw access, gain for roll access, and gain for pitch access, or some configuration like that. Then when you land, you can go in and learn the settings, and then refresh them to the center, which is really nice. Okay, so now we're at one X, just pay attention to how much change there is. Oops, I gotta give it throttle. Okay, throttle cuts back on. All the way up. And then off. So the idea is, as with any other plane that we've ever set up in the past, you always provide for an out. If you made a mistake on your setup, you always wanna have an out. So the out, if you get too much, is off. Okay, now, AS3X is different than safe. Safe will continue to operate, okay? So, safe, auto leveling keeps working regardless of your gain setting. But the AS3X within safe, the AS3X within safe, okay? Oh, I'm upside down. I gotta put it level. You hear how it's working? See how it's still working? So it's a little bit different, and so just be aware when you're in safe, AS3X is gonna be commanded by a different menu. All right, so in AS3X, we got everything going the right direction. We have our gains on our master knob in approximately the same position. Why do I want it in approximately the same position? Because I have many, many, many models set up on the same transmitter, and I want a neutral setting that I can start my flight from. Throttle cut on, reverse thrust in the normal setting, if I did reverse thrust. Middle setting for F, so that I know I'm in the middle setting for Expo. Top setting, if this was AS3X, that'd be AS3X. This would be safe, this would be off. This would be beeper, beeper, off, okay? I've also done a linger mode. This is flaps, I want it in takeoff setting when I go to takeoff setting and landing setting when I go to landing setting, but I want it in flight mode when I'm ready. Then I want the gear in the correct gear position. This is gear down, gear up, if I had gear. In this case, that's where safe is. Why do I not put safe here on this plane? Because I can get to this one quicker and easier, so I do it. 
And that's the same reason you do AS3X to the back and safe to the front, because it would be the same as gear down. No, it's just what I'm used to. And in this case, this is where the switch would mm -hmm. normally, the default position of the switch. Would be. The reason I have the default position of the throttle cut toward my belly is because if I have a lanyard arm on, I feel it's less likely that I would flip this down with a lanyard. And I do use a lanyard, I just take it off for the sake of the video. So anyway guys, the Marlin, this thing looks sweet. I'm excited to see it fly. It really reminds me a lot of the Futura, but it's not got retracts, okay? So very happy with it. 64 millimeters, it's gonna be fun. I'm excited to see it, obviously. Lots of power here. Let's show them. Let's show them this. It's like a little hurricane in, in, in a can. Oh, we were gonna blow off uh, the corner down here, so oh, let's do that real quick. Yeah, let's just do that. Just do a little cleaning, a little spring cleaning. No big deal. Just gotta get all that stuff. If you need a leaf blower, these things work great as leaf blowers. The other thing too that's nice is that if you guys want to help support our channel. You can buy one of these things for your very own. All you have to do is just look in the video description below. It's right there. If you're on a mobile device, sometimes it's a little bit harder to find, but it is right under the video, somewhere between the comments and the recommendations. But just look in there, there'll be links. When you follow those links, we'll get small commissions when you decide to buy. And if you don't decide to buy, that's fine. You can just go there. If you need to find a manual, or if you wanna find maybe a spare part, or if you have a servo that blows out on you and you need to replace it or landing gear, whatever it is, most of the companies that we work with are going to be offering some spare parts for you if you need them, especially the good ones like Arrows, um, the Horizons of the World and things like this. But we really appreciate uh, Hobby Zone's been really good to work with. Um, obviously, Horizon's been very good to us too. But at the end of the day, we serve your interests, not theirs. But we do it at the same time. We try to find the balance between totally beating people up over one bad issue but we do want to share what those issues are. Because after all, that's why you come to Brian Phillips RC so that you can make and basically investigate how good the plane is going to be before you buy. That's, that's what we assume you're doing. Um, or if you're a new pilot and you're trying to figure out how to get your feet wet, you're in the right place. We will help you get from uh, where you are now to where you want to be. And uh, I mean, if you're more advanced than us, obviously we know that that, that happens too. Um, but I would expect you're not going to be watching us set up a radio setup in that regard. But sometimes people pick up tricks that we do that they don't do. And so we appreciate you guys too being part of our community of RC like-minded individuals. And we love fixed wing. We love flying. We love aviation. We've been doing some PPG. We're going to roll that in more in the spring because obviously it's like painful to be outside, let alone going 25 miles an hour up in the abyss of the sky. But we can't bring, we can't wait to bring you more of that. And we actually have lots of new stuff to bring you uh, in just the next few days. So we're really excited to be part of all that. And uh, without further ado, guys, please do come back. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. But most of you guys are probably already subscribed. But we appreciate you being here and being a part. If you want to support us other than buying the planes, we have Patreon and PayPal. PayPal's for just one-time things. Patreon is like a monthly thing. Uh, just keeping in mind, the fee structure is very high on Patreon. There's virtually no fees on PayPal. There's no fees for you to buy this thing and enjoy it and love it. And then of course we get a small commission that you don't have to pay, which we think is the best deal for you. Again, we're always looking out for you guys at the end of the day, because we want to bring you the best, the latest and greatest in the technology that's available. And then you guys can sort through and decide what you like best and then you can support us that way. So thanks for being here. We appreciate you. We wouldn't have the channel if you wouldn't keep watching. And so we thank you again for another great year too. It's a new year, except it was a new year like a month ago. I don't know when this is, our tree is still up. That's right, for Christmas. It's Christmas. Merry it's Christmas. like three days later. Of 2000, whatever, 20, <laughs> that one, that year. Thanks for watching. Come back for more.